webinar. Today we're be, we'll be talking about CADI, and um, our presenters are from Providence Health Systems and Dartmouth-Hitchcock, and I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. But moving on to a couple of announcements. So that tomorrow we're having a special encore presentation of our Vanquishing VAP webinar. Um, that will begin at 6 a.m. Mountain Time, and you can see the other times listed on the slides. But um, that was an excellent webinar, and we're excited to be able to offer it as an encore. So please um, join that if you're able. The call-in and web information is on henlearner.org on the calendar. You'll be able to find the information to to join that webinar. Um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our um, our presenters and let them go ahead and take it. Mary, we'll let you start. Sure. I'm Mary Waldo. I am the Director of Nursing Practice Research and Professional Development at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center, and that's in Portland, Oregon. And with me is Mary Shanks. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mary Shanks. I am the Infection Preventionist here at Providence St. Vincent. I've been here for seven years, uh, coming from another system, and I do the uh, actual surveillance for uh, catheter-associated infections uh, in the facility. Tammy, would you introduce yourself? <clears throat> I'm Tammy Sanders, Infection Prevention Coordinator at St. Patrick's Hospital in Missoula, Montana. I've been an ICP for five years, and I do the surveillance um, for our hospital here in western Montana. And Buffy? Hi, I'm Buffy Melamans. I'm a registered nurse and a project specialist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Lebanon, New Hampshire. Great. Next slide. And the CME statements are there, and I'm not going to go through it. Next slide. So how we're going to do this, the first 30 minutes will be telling you um, a little bit about what we've done at Providence St. Vincent's, what is some of the best evidence. Uh, Buffy will then follow with what they're doing at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and then at the end, Tammy will join in about Providence St. Patrick's, and we are leaving time for questions and answers. So if you'll hold your questions to the end, I'd, I'd really appreciate it. Next slide. So we have four objectives today. One, the first one is to identify best practices for prevention of catheter-associated urinary tract infections, or CAUTI, from here on out. That will be a very small portion of this program because it is so well documented. We're going to spend most of our time describing methods for implementation of best practices. We'll describe one urinary catheter insertion or removal protocol, and also by the end, I hope you understand the measures and data required to benchmark best practices. Next slide. So just a um, uh, fun fact is the urinary catheter was developed by Dr. Frederick Foley in the 1920s. And as of today, more than 40% of hospital-acquired infections are urinary tract infections. So that makes UTIs the most common type of our hospital-acquired infections. 80% of UTIs in hospital settings are estimated to be catheter-associated, and depending on the reference, this ranges from approximately 480,000 to 600,000 CADIs a year. Up to 25% of hospitalized patients will have a urinary catheter during their stay, and the highest rate is in the critical care units, and most of the catheters are placed in critical care in the emergency department or in surgical services. There is a mortality rate of about 2.3%, and that's attributed to urinary tract infections every year. And the estimated cost for a non-complicated UTI ranges from about $500 to $1,000 per person. And obviously, this cost increases much more if it then goes to sepsis or anything else. Next slide. There are three main risk factors for CAUTI. And these are modifiable risk factors, and they've been identified by CDC. The first is prolonged catheterization. Now, 
the risk of bacteria increases with each day. So about 5% of patients who have a urinary catheter for one day will develop a UTI. Patients who have it for a week, about a quarter of those, or 25%, will develop a UTI. And patients who have a Foley catheter or an indwelling catheter for a month is very close to 100% of those patients will develop a urinary tract infection. The second main risk factor is breaking the closed system, and that's anywhere from the tip of the catheter located in the bladder down to the collection bag. And the third main risk factor is inadequate uh, staff training. Now, in the past at Providence, we have focused a lot of our training on the med surge nurses, and we have recently discovered that most of our catheters are inserted in other areas, and this has helped us change our focus for training. Next slide. So even with these risk factors, we know that cauties can be prevented. The best practices for cauti prevention have been identified by CDC and other people, and these include first, ensuring competency of proper technique for insertion and maintenance. What we found is, and you know, I had always thought that why do we need to train nurses catheters or how to maintain catheters? This is something that every nurse learns. But as with everything else, if it's not done every day or if they've been a nurse for a long time, sloppy practices can exist. And so we had to, at St. Vincent's, go back and look at what is the proper technique for both insertion and maintenance. Uh, second best practice is to develop or consider the need for catheter, for the catheter in the first place to ensure there's appropriate use. About 50% of patients who have catheters in medical surgical units really don't have a valid reason for that urinary catheter to remain. Third practice is to promote early removal of catheters when it's no longer indicated. And I want to highlight that this is not just a nursing focus. This needs to be the focus of every clinician who sees the patient, including rehabilitation, uh, physicians or LIPs, transportation, et cetera. And then finally, institutional support and sponsorship for CADI reduction. Now, as I said before, there is lots of information about best practices or CADI bundle. A good reference is the CDC guidelines, and we've added a link to that at the end of this presentation. Other areas that are helpful for preventing CADIs is daily cleansing, use of securement devices, position of bag, et cetera. Next slide. So how do you get started? I think a primary uh, importance of any new initiative is to make sure there's faculty leadership that prioritizes and focuses the work, such as nurses, physicians, administration. And this is very important in our rapidly changing healthcare environment where there are so many new initiatives, new guidelines, new practices that start every month. Interdisciplinary collaboration is huge. Um, I think the two is the infection control practitioners. Mary Shanks and her team were instrumental. We couldn't have gotten off the ground without them. Another one is clinical information. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but we lost our ability to get denominator rates. And if it wasn't for the help of the clinical informatics, um, collaboration between the two teams, I think there would be no hope that we would ever reach that. Other discipline, quality management, case managers, clinicians. Uh, another key point is to ensure that everyone is familiar with the model of improvement you're using. So for Demay, if you have questions about that, I'll refer you to Buffy. And if you have questions about PDSA, um, then I'd be happy to take them later. So as an example, 
let me give you what we did very briefly at, uh, in the Provident system. Prevention of CADI was given a very high rating um, and was defined by our quality council, which is interdisciplinary, is made up of all discipline leadership. It's uh, facilitated by quality management. So both the local quality council, our regional quality council, and then we are part of a 32 hospital system and our system leadership also mandated that prevention of CADI uh, was a focus. Executive sponsorship was assigned in each facility. Here it was our chief nurse and our chief medical officer. We had collaboration between the Regional Nursing Practice Council, our Data Governance Council, the, all of the local infection control practitioners, and our local practice council. And currently we are gathering monthly rates, debriefing every catheter associated uh, infection um, monitoring. Okay. Next slide. Yes, I have a form I'll project. I have a form that I complete uh, with the patient information, uh, the date the catheter was inserted, the place the catheter was inserted, if there was documentation of the reason, and this is sent to the uh, unit to which the infection is attributed uh, for uh, review. Let them know what I feel were risk factors and how were they addressed, and if there is further work needed by that unit to identify what they could have done better. Okay, good. Next slide. Oops, go back. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Uh, so as I've already said, you need to identify all the stakeholders. And again, there were some stakeholders that we did not consider, which was the emergency department technicians, surgical services, and there is some thought about looking for those people who may put catheters in in the field. Develop education materials and processes. Uh, education needs to include know when a catheter is necessary, how to know when we can pull a catheter, cert, how to maintain, um, and those are some of the key points. I just want to highlight there's a difference between insertion competency and maintenance competency and that some of the staff vary depending on whether you're looking at insertion or maintenance. For example, transportation, diagnostic imaging is very important to help them understand and learn about maintenance and then focus insertion for those units and people who actually insert. Next slide. Is this the slide you will? Okay. So on the screen now is Providence's urinary catheter insertion competency. We start with a training module in HealthStream, and then we have a, this form that we use, and it's completed by a coworker for each nurse that is trained. If you have any questions about this form, we'd be happy to answer it either at the end or via email. Next slide. Mary, I'm just going to jump in here. This is Amy. Can I ask all of our attendees to please put your phone on mute? Thank you. I think one of the most important uh, steps in any process of, for implementation of an initi initiative is to assess current practice and look at gaps. And for urinary tract infections, we looked at four areas in our gap analysis. One was through observation, how catheters were being inserted and how catheters were being maintained. The other was Mary was very instrumental in looking at the gap analysis of what data we needed and what data we were able to obtain, both in number of catheter days and also in the number of urinary tract infections. A third area of our gap analysis was products. We'll talk a little more about that later. But for urinary tract infections, we looked at 
Was everything that is needed was it easily accessible? Was there a good flow to the use of the products? And then finally, barriers. There are two customers here. One is the voice of the clinician. And barriers, again, is unable to find equipment, unable to use them in an easy workflow but also the voice of the patient. And I did numerous rounds with patients with Foley catheters to find out what the barriers were for us to take their catheters out and learn quite a bit about um, ease, ease of convenience for patients when they're tired, when they're hurting, they don't want to get out of bed, they really do like that Foley catheter. Uh, next page. We have an example on a, uh, another slide about practice guidelines and nursing protocols that were developed. And again, our ICPs were instrumental in first making sure that we had up-to-date and the best evidence, and also in helping us to implement them in all our facilities. The final the final point on uh, this slide is to reinforce education and competencies. We have what I'm sure happens in a lot of facilities, we have what we call the flavor of the month. And again, with so many changes and new initiatives coming down, the nurses, as long as there is spotlight on something, they will pay attention and then when the next new focus or priority comes along, we tend to forget what we've already learned. And so in reinforcing education and competency, what I like to do is combine new initiatives with previous initiatives. So instead of saying we're going to focus on hospital-acquired pressure ulcers, focus on hand washing, focus on sepsis, focus on intake and output, focus on prevention of cauties, how can we bundle those things together so that the practitioner, instead of isolating or putting these different bundles in silos will really think of them all at the same time in terms of safety. Next slide. So this is just the first page of our catheter-associated CAUTI prevention in adults and patients. And we would be happy in Providence to share this with anybody who would like it. Next slide. Uh, defining measures and data collection processes. Um, Mary's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, do you want to do that now? <coughs> oh, <coughs> excuse me, sure. Okay. Well, um, the definitions, do you want me to talk about the CDC? We yes. use, um, just like every other hospital that has to report um, CAUTIs, uh, we report them to CDC using standardized definitions uh, laid out by Nishin, which was developed by uh, HICPAC, which is the um, body given uh, the authority by CDC to develop these guidelines. And um, these guidelines then um, also help to form definitions. So um, the definitions are reviewed and updated. Um, frequently we have a new iteration uh, starting in 2013. So we apply the definition to every uh, po positive um, or case that we identify as being a possible uh, CAUTI. We uh, use uh, standardized uh, definitions to gather our uh, numerator and denominator, the denominator being the population at risk. So everybody in that particular place, whether it's hospital-wide, if you're doing hospital-wide surveillance or in a particular unit, um, the devices would be, the, the denominator would be the number of patients with the device uh, in the unit per day. You add that up by the month. So that's your numerator, the number of UTIs, um, using your standardized definition, and the denominator is are your device days in that unit. Okay. And we have that information on a slide a little further down. And then we'll have much more detail on measurement systems um, in one of our affinity group calls. Next slide. 
What we did in, in Providence is we develop a sheet for each one of our metrics, and then that is one way that we standardize between units and between facilities. Next slide. So I think the primary take-home message I'd, I'd like you to have is getting rid of potties is not easy work. This is not a sexy topic. There's not a lot of excitement around decreasing potties. Um, it really takes collaboration between disciplines. It takes ongoing work. And it really takes a change in your facility's culture about the why we use Foley catheters and when we can take them out. The basics that are there is promoting cotty reduction, measuring performance, reinforcing education and competency. We found that it's easier to start with a small unit, get the processes, the workflow um, to where they're manageable, and then spread it out to the rest of the facility. Next slide. What we've done in Providence is we've implemented or incorporated the assessment of need for Foley catheter into the workflow. We have um, patient lists, or so lists of patients who have catheters that go out to the unit. The charge nurse can pick those up. We're trying to get a list of patients with catheters for each nurse. We talk about it at shift-to-shift -shift handover, and we talk about it at safety huddles at the beginning of the shift. And then as nurses make rounds with physicians, our physicians are just as aware, usually, as nurses, how long the catheter has been in and the need to take it out. So it's also discussed on those interdisciplinary rounds. There's a program of peer review um, in place, and Mary will talk about something we're thinking about in ICU, but we had nurses, students audit catheter placement, and we've also had nursing students bring up breaks and techniques for catheter maintenance. And it worked fairly well, uh, but there were some problems. Nurses, nursing students are great at noticing breaks and sterile technique, but they don't feel comfortable speaking up and telling the nurse who has a license working that there was a break in sterile technique. Uh, next, next slide. I think the only thing I want to add on from this slide is that Mary Shanks, our infection co-practitioner, and uh, has rounded numerous times with nurses on our unit talking about why the catheter was in place, why it could come out, and the reasons why it needed to come out. Next slide. Make sure that the patients and families are educated and involved. I, a couple of months ago, I talked to a family who was adamant that that mom's Foley catheter was not coming out and actually prevented the nurse from taking it out. When I went up to talk to them, they, what they told me was, mom never gets any sleep, she hurts, and if you leave the catheter in, she doesn't have to get up as often. Once I told them about the risk of having a catheter in, um, what would happen if she developed a urinary, urinary tract infection, then they were quite pleased to have that catheter taken out once they understood the reasons why. Consider the alternatives to an indwelling catheter, such as a female urinal, bedside commode, incontinence brief, and actually the straight in and out catheters pose less of a risk for urinary tract infection than an indwelling do one does. I thought it was an announcement over the PA. I was like, that's the longest announcement ever. <laughs> was that a question? No. Okay, next slide. Um, we'll share with you uh, a picture of our nurse-driven uh, catheter removal protocol. And again, if you'd like more information, we're happy to send that out. We did a number of things. Uh, we made changes to the order set where post 
surgery, there was an automatic discontinuation of Foley catheters. Uh, we have recently gone to Epic. It has caused us, as I said, some difficulty with obtaining denominator rates, but we are hoping that we can put the checklist for catheter insertion and for removal into the electronic medical record. We also work with Medline, which is um, a healthcare equipment company. And what we discovered was, while watching nurses is that the setup of the insertion kit was not intuitive. It was not easy for a nurse or anyone to open the catheter kit and figure out what to do first, what to do next, and there were areas where it was really easy to have a break in technique just because of how, of how it was set up. We also noted that nurses forgot to get their supplies to do a peri-wash prior to insertion. And so we worked with Medline and was able to develop a catheter insertion kit that really helped the nurses' workflow in terms of inserting a catheter without breaks of sterile technique. And I wanted Mary to talk just a little bit about next steps in critical care that they're considering. Yes, uh, in spite of, you know, adhering to the best practices that we've been talking about, um, noted an increase in uh, infections in our critical care, just, you know, a small amount. And I just want to uh, just advise everybody that um, because we're getting better at pulling catheters out, our device days are, are getting smaller. So that means that our rates will go higher um, just because of the smaller denominator. It means we're doing a better job at getting them out, but the rates will not reflect that. So I know that uh, CDC Nition is considering changing the denominator to patient days rather than um, device days, just a FYI on that. But one of the problems in our ICU um, relates to insertion technique, because often these are inserted in critically ill patients, and there may not be the focus on uh, asepsis as much as we'd like. So the medical director of the unit has uh, suggested something that really, I think, will, will gain some traction. And that is that we use a Foley insertion bundle very similar to uh, that used for central line insertion. That the Foley should be inserted not by one, but there should be two nurses or a nurse and assistant at um, the bedside for Foley catheter insertion. One to assist and also observe to make sure that there's no breaks in technique and to make sure that, you know, the catheter is changed if there is a misplacement uh, outside the urethra so that it is not reinserted into the urethra, which sometimes happens during the course of a catheterization. So um, this would be something that would just list the best practices for catheter insertion and be checked off. So whether um, this is feasible at all times, may not, maybe not, but I think that this is something we're going to do a feasibility study to see if we can implement this in our critical care areas and in our emergency room where um, catheters are often placed and then the patients are sent to the ICU where they can develop a UTI a day or two later as a result of insertion. Can I ask a question about that? Yes. Yeah. My name is Donna Moorhead. I'm the manager of the ICU over Baylor Medical Center at Irving. Just out of curiosity, did you happen to take a look at each of these infections and to see if they actually occurred within the first 48 hours? Yes. Yeah, the, um, the catheter dwell time to infection is always listed on my line list for infections. And those early infections, okay. there's no, um, no signs or symptoms on admission are, you know, very much likely to be insertion-related. I was, I was kind of curious because I went back and looked at over 200 um, over a period of two years at our facility, and when I went back, I found that most of them were not from insertion, and maybe just our facility. Insertion was not our particular problem, but it actually took some, I mean, it took me, it took me probably working in the evening on my own time, uh -huh. 
close to two months um, to take a look at all of those, and I was really surprised at what I found. It, insertion was not our particular problem, so I was wondering if you had broken it down by like that. Actually, I have, and you're, I don't have my data in front of me, but I'd say at least 50% of my uh, wow. yeah. are early, because we're getting better at taking our catheters out. Got the same issue with as we've driven our utilization because we monitor our utilization as much as we do our infection rate. Exactly. But um, I was really surprised when I started drilling into these to see where they were when they were occurring. Most of ours are occurring about a week out. So yeah, okay. yeah, it's about half of ours. Okay. Next slide. So here is our urinary catheter removal algorithm. And as you know, these slides are available. And again, we're happy to talk to anyone about it. And so I'm not going through them uh, right now. Next slide. Here is a silver Foley catheter tray that we worked with Medline uh, to rearrange the content so that it flowed better for the nurse in picking up equipment and when inserting, inserting the catheter. And We'll have an affinity group call on silver alloy catheters and other special equipment. Next slide. So these are the numerators and denominators, uh, the data that Mary Shanks already talked about. I just want to add something that I didn't know prior to a few months ago, is that there are catheter-associated urinary tract infections. And so even if the organism is not one that you typically find with a cauti, if, there, if you cannot find the source of the infection, then it's attributed to whether it's a catheter or a central line, whatever happens to be in the person at that time. Um, Mary's going to talk just a little bit about the changes in definitions for 2013. Well, actually, there's not that many changes. They just specifically say, to give you that two uh, greater than two calendar days time frame because before it was not clear. You know, the um, mission would often answer your question saying that any uh, organism that showed up um, regardless of the time um, would be um, attributable to the Foley catheter. So they've clarified that with a greater than two days length of stay. They've also separated out um, asymptomatic uh, bacteria with secondary uh, bloodstream infections so those would be reported, but we're not reporting asymptomatic bacteria. Thank you. Uh, next slide. And so some of the things that we can collect and track is if urinary catheters are being removed on post-op day one or post-op day two after surgery. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I think that's all that I want to say about that because the measure specifications will be available on HIN Learner. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to Buffy at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Buffy? Thank you, Mary. So I'm going to spend some time just reviewing a lot of the steps that Mary has presented, but with examples from what our experience has been. First, it's really important to understand what your current system is as it compares to evidence-based practice. And I suggest starting with the three main modifiable risk factors. The first one being, do you have a system to assess and remove catheters when they're no longer necessary? We found that we had no policy or common language around what was an appropriate indication for catheter use. We started with a policy statement that incorporated the HIC-PAC guidelines. This gave the foundation for how we use catheters, how often we assess the need for catheters, how we document catheter use, and how we discontinue catheters. That way everybody was speaking the same language. Our work started with a pilot on one unit. We identified that there was no process for daily review of the need for a catheter. We trialed using a laminated sign that was created for each patient's door that prompted nurses to review the need for a catheter at least daily with the care team. The sign outlines the appropriate indications for catheter use and directed the team to discontinue a catheter when no longer indicated or to document why it was still indicated. We were able to achieve 100% compliance with this process within two weeks of our pilot. 
Another way that we assessed our current practice was to do a chart review for our cases of CAUTI as well as all skip failures for the past year to look for root causes. We found that about 80% of our skip failures were related to orders. The three categories for order failures were no order at all existed to discontinue the catheter, or an order was written on post-op day three or later, despite documentation in the chart that the patient was progressing as expected, including ambulating by post-op day one or two. So we identified these as potential education gaps or knowledge gaps. The third category involved epidural use. It's commonly believed that the presence of an epidural requires the use of a urinary catheter, which is not true. The location of the epidural impacts the effects on spontaneous voiding. We frequently see thoracic epidurals, and these patients are out of bed and ambulating by post-op day one or two. If you have an epidural in place and you're able to ambulate independently, you're most likely going to be able to void spontaneously. A trial should be done with the use of periodic bladder scanning, if that's the case. If they then demonstrate acute retention, then it would be an appropriate use for a catheter. So there were lots of ways that we thought about that we could target the problems we were having with orders, but we believed that the most feasible and comprehensive way was to create a standard order protocol for discontinuing catheters when they were no longer meeting criteria. So this is like the nurse-driven protocol that Mary had mentioned earlier. It's also been identified in the literature as a very successful intervention, so this is what we're working on at this time. So the next risk factor is, do you maintain a closed drainage system in all departments all the time? We learned from conversations with staff that the ICU frequently were breaking the closed system to do intra-abdominal pressure monitoring or to add a urimeter. So we collected data and discovered that 25% of our ICU patients had the closed system broken at some point, and about 98% of our ICU patients had catheters in place, so the potential impact was large. This directed us to investigate a new product that allows us to maintain a closed system while doing pressure monitoring. So the third main modifiable risk factor was, do you have a process for assuring competency of all clinicians that participate in catheter insertion and maintenance? We're working right now on the logistics of requiring all clinical staff to demonstrate competency. Having physician leadership support as well as data is absolutely key to getting buy-in from the larger audience. We track patient injury related to insertion practices as well as infection rates, and we share that with the key groups. We'll be working with our urology department, our simulation education training center, and our nursing leadership to create a process for this. This is really complicated and difficult work logistically, but it's well supported in the literature that all clinicians who participate in catheter insertion are properly trained. And it's important to realize that competency involves both a technical skill as well as knowledge of current evidence. A clinician trained 10 years ago may be very competent in the technical skill, but may not be aware of current evidence regarding catheter use. Also, the variation that exists in training of clinicians needs to be considered. Your organization's responsibility is to the safety of the patients you care for, so assuring competency of your clinicians is foundational. Next slide, please. It's also critical to understand your customer's needs when getting started. In this case, with our pilot work and the bulk of our interventions to start, our customer is our clinician. In addition to involving the key stakeholders on our team, we broadly surveyed clinicians who will be affected by this work to assess their beliefs about catheter use. You want to ask them questions like, do they believe catheters pose a risk to patients, or what concerns them about using catheters less frequently? Asking these types of questions helps you to understand where to target your efforts. The majority of our nurses believed that we use catheters just the right amount, but we had catheter utilization ratios that were showing otherwise. So from that, we knew that we needed to target our education on what appropriate use is. The biggest concern that was identified for our nurses about using catheters less frequently was for skin breakdown due to incontinence. We're thrilled that nurses were thinking about skin integrity, so we then paired with our group working on pressure ulcers to align our interventions in the education. We know that if we don't target this belief, we'll never be able to sustain changes with our nurses. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to just take a minute to review some key takeaways from our experiences. Have somebody on your team who understands improvement methodology. Using a systematic approach will be your key to sustainable success. It's common for groups to come together and want to jump to what they think the solution should be without gaining an understanding of the local context. 
Another common problem with improvement is understanding your data. What is the metric telling you about your process? As you implement change, how do you know that something is an improvement versus just random variation? Having somebody on your team who understands these issues and organizes your work around a particular methodology will help you to avoid common pitfalls and allow you to implement change that can be sustained. Before using any intervention, figure out who the customer for that particular intervention is, then get their opinions before piloting the intervention. This will give you valuable insight and give you buy-in from participants. I gave an example a little while ago of our nurses' opinions that we sought, but there may, may be interventions that you want to try that target physicians, transportation, or maybe specifically to patients. I know Mary had some examples of that in her presentation. So seek their opinions before testing a new intervention, and then use their opinions to refine the intervention, and you'll be able to find you'll have a lot more success. Next slide, please. Then consider your data needs. Once you get a sense of your current situation and what your gaps are, you may find that additional metrics will be helpful to guide your work. Rather than just looking at CAUTI rates, which might be only obtained in your ICU settings, but you want a broader sense of what's happening throughout your organization, you may want to look at catheter utilization ratios or the percent of catheters that are used for appropriate indications. Let your knowledge of your local context help you decide what metrics you need to direct your efforts. And it's very important to remember that data gives us direction, which is super important, but emotion motivates change. It's imperative to link real patient stories to this work. If you find that your nurses believe that catheters should be used for incontinence, then find a real patient story to demonstrate why this can cause harm. I've seen this done at several organizations, and it can be really powerful. Frequently, clinicians believe for one example, that if a patient is confused or disoriented, that it's safer for them to have a catheter as they would otherwise be incontinent. One organization used a story of this type of patient who sustained considerable harm because he pulled the catheter out. We're all here to provide the best care that we can for our patients, so when you use these real-life stories, that gives us the motivation to change our practice. Next slide, please. Also, make sure that your focus is on appropriate use of catheters versus decreased use of catheters. You want the message to stimulate critical thinking on what's indicated for each patient and not to cause harm by avoiding a catheter when it's really needed. When you're getting started, you'll likely find that you use catheters too frequently, so your improvements will result in decreasing use. But the focus of your education and your efforts should be on appropriate use with competent insertion and maintenance. We had a few surgeons that learned about cauti prevention before we had started our organizational-wide work, and they wanted to be proactive. They made a point of removing catheters while their patients were still in the OR. This could be a perfect intervention, but in this case, they didn't coordinate their interventions with the recovery room nurses. The nurses had no idea why this sudden change was happening, and they were finding patients with large bladder volumes and unable to void, requiring that catheters be replaced. There was no established system to monitor these patients for acute retention, so it negatively impacted their workflow when the nurses had to obtain orders to straight cath or to replace catheters. These surgeons were trying to do the right thing by decreasing catheter use, but it inadvertently led to potential patient harm in the recovery room. It's safe for your, for your patients, and it will lead to sustainable change if your improvement efforts are really well coordinated and focused on appropriate use versus just decreased use. And also, it's important to look for opportunities to combine your CAUTI prevention work with other initiatives. Many of the HEN initiatives can find overlapping interventions that work together. For example, if you do daily rounding to assess the need for a fully catheter, you may also find that that works for your CLABC interventions as well as adverse drug reactions and many other um, of the initiatives can, be, can use a tool like daily rounding. And then frequent incontinence checks facilitate skin care. So there's multiple ways that interventions that will work for CAUTI can work for other interventions as well, and you'll get the most um, success if you try to combine those efforts when you can. So some final thoughts. Improvement work should move. Don't let yourself have multiple meetings that produce a lot of talk but don't lead to improvement. And allow yourself to fail. You'll not find the perfect solutions in a conference room. It takes piloting small tests of change using plan, do, study, act cycles to really make improvement. The best description of this 
that I heard of came from Dan Heath. He's the co-author of Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard. He was presenting a keynote speech at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement National Conference, and he had us visualize a toddler learning how to walk. They fall hundreds of times before mastering the skill. Each time they fall, they get back up and they try it a little differently until they get it. It's a perfect PDSA cycle. And the adults or the sponsors of this child, they don't give up and say, oh, maybe he just won't be a walker. We better try something else. The sponsors give support and they break down barriers. I love this example. It really nicely demonstrates the improvement process. So the bottom line, change is hard and that's okay. You want to use an improvement methodology, understand your local context, know your customers' needs and beliefs, use data to direct you and to understand your systems, and use emotion to motivate change. Be tenacious for the sake of your patients, and you can do it. And that is all I have today. I'll hand it back over to Amy. Thank you, um, Mary, Mary, and Buffy. We appreciate your presentation. We have a little bit of time left over. Are there questions from our attendees? You can either type them into the chat box or you can speak up. Any questions? Sorry, I still on that one. Really? Because you have to get the fully strapped. Separate. You have to get the what else? Buffy to and Mary and Mary, do you have anything you'd like to um, reiterate or any comments you'd like to make now that the presentation's over? No, but I would like Tammy to chime in from St. Pat. Great. Thank you, Mary. Um, my name is Tammy Powers, and I work at St. Pat's, as I said in the beginning of the uh, introductions. And we're a 200 bed hospital serving western Montana and parts of Idaho. And we're level two trauma uh, services with uh, cardiac surgery and cancer services. And our intensivists and nurses um, believe that our device utilization was higher than the national benchmarks for our type of ICU because of our high acuity and our high case mix index. When I began working with our state quality improvement organization in a learning action network with the aim to reduce quality, um, the QIO provided us with quarterly reports comparing our device utilization with the aggregate data in our state of other ICUs. And our device utilization was averaging around 80%, and, our, and in the state with like ICUs was about 60%. So that got everybody's attention in our ICU. And during our daily multidisciplinary rounds, Catheter, correct catheter utilization and determination of uh, clinical indication was emphasized with the intensivists and the nurses during rounding by either myself or if I was not able to participate, the charge nurse. And at first, we had a lot of concerns related to managing the incontinent patient. Um, and we educated the nurses just in time education about the, uh, their um, the usefulness of straight catheters, straight in and out catheterizations, uh, use, appropriate use of uh, urinals, both female urinals, male urinals, condom casts, incontinent briefs, and um, bedside commodes. And we made sure that this equipment was um, readily available by the bedside or in our um, omni cells so that nurses could utilize them. Um, we also uh, posted device utilization daily uh, on the unit so they could see how they were doing. Uh, once the nurses realized they could manage many of these patients that no longer had an in, a clinical indication for a catheter without a catheter, um, they uh, made that extra effort to remove the catheter, and especially before they transferred the patients outside of ICU, uh, for most part, we were able to uh, remove the catheter on those patients. And as a result, our device utilization in ICU um, in, in just a matter of a, a month was down 20%. And that, um, th those reductions in ICU led to even greater reductions in our inpatient units, our um, surgical medical units these patients transferred to. Um, those units had saw a 50% reduction in device utilization. And our intensivists at the time also got on board and made um, urinary um, catheter utilization reduce reductions part of their quality goals. So they had uh, 
uh, skin in the game, and, and they had a stake in reducing uh, Foley catheter usage as well. Um, so we really changed the culture in our ICU uh, from thinking that every ICU patient practically needs a Foley catheter to just the select patients need a catheter when they meet the clinical indications um, that are approved by um, the CDC guidelines that Mary talked about and Buffy talked about. So um, even though we're a you know, hospital in a rural part of the country, uh, we were able to really reduce our device utilization uh, by focusing on the interdisciplinary rounding and providing and, and reinforcing uh, with our nurses that there are alternatives. And we had done plenty of education. Um, we've done the uh, health stream education and um, many uh, annual, annual um, quality reduction education, but having that interaction with the nurse at the bedside and giving that just-in-time feedback and education I think really uh, helped us reduce our utilization. And um, thank you. Mary, we've had a couple of questions come in through the chat boxes. The first one is, in overcoming flavor of the month syndrome, what ideas have you had to get the nurses to think of an entire safety bundle? So what, uh, one of the newest things we've done is our medical director has developed its uh, it's a laminated card with information on both sides. He has pulled out the eight most prevalent safety issues in healthcare today, and he is training the residents and interns and the hospitalists to do handover via that tool. And we brought it to our nursing practice council. We're going to look at it, and in that way, uh, have communication with physicians. In looking at that card, it very much uses the whole person but identifies area within that person that we need to be aware of. And so I think that's going to be very helpful. Yeah, this was um, actually uh, brought up at uh, a recent repose um, analysis we were doing. and. Um, handover and lack of communication was identified as a, a factor in this particular uh, event that we were reviewing. So this tool then was mentioned by the medical director and it was agreed that it would be an excellent tool not only for physicians but also nurses to use for rounding and handovers. It includes, does the patient have a line? So Plasti cotty. So you're looking at all of the uh, device-associated things, as well as any signs of sepsis and uh, anything uh, else. Um, I think we could actually include a copy of that. Mm -hmm. The other, when a new initiative comes out, I take a look at the ones that are already there and identify similar steps. And so that as we're doing training, as we're developing protocols, we'll link them at that time. So example, urinary incontinence, um, as I think it was Buffy mentioned, people are concerned that that would cause skin breakdown. We've also identified that urinary incontinence is, causes uh, increased risk for falls. So how do we address the urinary incontinence issue and stay true to the reasons why we need to have a, a catheter. And then it allows the nurses, it helps the nurses to incorporate that thinking into a holistic a approach rather than looking at one piece of the puzzle each time they go in the room. Right. Thank Buffy, you, do you have anything to add? No, I think that really covers it. It was exactly the same thing that we found, that you want to really look for those opportunities to build on um, things that staff are already doing um, and look for where the overlap is. And then we have a head steering committee at our organization, so they're looking at all the work of the 10 different teams that we have and the different topics and where the overlaps are. How can they bring those things together and bundle some of the interventions for the exact reason that you're mentioning? Great, thank you. Um, we've had another question come in about the outcome measures. 
whether they're based on NHSN data. Um, the, the details for the, for the measures and the um, metric specifications will be posted on the henlearner.org website under the resource section. Um, but Mary or Buffy, if you guys would like to, to comment on that right now, that would be fine too. Sure, this is Mary Shanks. I'll be happy to. Uh, yes, we use the standardized definitions published by CDC and Nishin uh, to 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 use to so that we're calling so all of us across the country are calling the same thing a catheter associated UTI. We're using the same methodology to report our denominators, so our rates should be comparable um, to each other. So you can then. Benchmark. So CDC also publishes benchmark data that we can compare ourselves to to see how we're doing uh, compared to other facilities of our size and, and shape. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, we've had one more request for the email addresses of the presenters. Um, if our presenters are okay with it, we'll make sure that their email addresses are available on the final slide set that will be posted to henlearner.org. That's great. Yeah. Great. Um, do you have any other questions that you'd like to put in the chat box or that you can shout out? Okay. From our presenters, anything else you'd like to comment on or make suggestions on? Okay. Um, just to let you know, one of the um, we'll be hosting affinity calls on this topic starting next month. Um, the dates and times have not yet been finalized, but we'll get that information up on the henlearner.org calendar as soon as it's available. Um, and also, please remember again the special encore presentation tomorrow of the VAP webinar, and you can find the information and log on information for that also on the henlearner.org calendar. We thank you for your time. We thank our presenters for their time and their expertise. Um, it's been a great webinar. Thank you all. I don't think it's a re-taping. Right. Yeah. That, that was the one that we listened to in December. No, I don't think there's anything different. Do we need to listen to that again? No. Because I had it down like 12-3 that we listened to that. And oh, okay. Good. The only thing is, you know, if we're supposed to reduce by 40 the measures change for VAP. From VAP to IVAP or whatever.